Welcome to the Cosmic Eye Show, where we explore spiritual ideas and books that help you live a better life. Hosted by spiritual teacher and author of If You Can Worry, You Can Meditate, Jason Napolitano. Hi, welcome to the Cosmic Eye Show. I am Jason Napolitano. I am the author of If You Can Worry, You Can Meditate. And on the line, I have Chris Sheridan, who is the author of The Spirit in the Sky. Uh, Both our books are available on Amazon. My book is also available on CosmicEye.org and Chris's on ChrisSheridan.com. Hello, Chris. Hello, Jason. Good to be here again today. It is good to have you here today. Uh, Happy Indie Weekend. I know you're a big fan. And... uh, Oh, yeah. I appreciate you being here, but the race is already over for today. So you already got your race fix in now. All right. Beautiful. So today <laughs> we are going to be examining the middle passage the, uh, from misery to meaning in midlife by James Hollis. Basically, we're going to be looking at midlife crisis and so forth. And this book is about how to survive and even thrive as one moves from Uh, The first period of adulthood, which he calls the first adulthood, into the second period or second half, which is after midlife, um, and uh, makes that transition into into that period of hopefully uh, wisdom and understanding and greater meaning of life. So we're just going to go ahead and jump right into this. There's a lot of material to cover. We're not going to be able to cover uh, nearly all of the points in this book, as we spoke about earlier. So we're going to hit on a few of the main the main points and kind of get at uh, some of the big, the big rocks, the big, the big chunks of material that need to be uh, looked at. And then uh, hopefully you will purchase this book, the middle passage by James Hollis and, and read through it on your own. It's not a long book, but it's again, like, like the Manly Hall stuff we've looked at that's short, deceptively short. There's a ton of, ton of stuff in it. You, You found that as well, right? I did. It's very dense. And also, uh, you know, the text is a fairly small, small point. So, so the pages are, are not only loaded with, uh, you know, amount, there's just a depth. Yeah, exactly. And obviously this is a challenging thing for people. You know, we see today, you know, midlife we know is a period anywhere from, you know, age 35 to, you know, 70 anymore for people. Uh, it really depends. And he does point out that it really isn't based on chronological time. It's based on Kairos time. You know, there's Kronos time and Kairos time. Kairos time is more more meaning oriented and psychological. You know, this sort of passage is going to occur when it's going to occur in your life. Um, as I said, you know, some people find they find themselves in midlife at age at age 30 or 35 some people at at 50 some people at 65 it 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 just really depends um one uh one thing he says i'll just read this this great this great quote from him uh it's on page 7 uh the midlife crisis which i prefer to call the middle passage presents us with an opportunity to reexamine our lives and ask the sometimes frightening always liberating question who am i apart from my history and roles uh, that I played. And, um, and then he goes on to mention, Hollis goes on to mention when we discover that we have been living, what we have been living constitutes a false self that we've been enacting a provisional adulthood driven by unrealistic expe- expectations. Then we open the possibility for the second adulthood, our true personhood. So that second adulthood is that passage uh, through uh, the first adulthood, which it's interesting because he actually lays out three stages of life. I found this, this fascinating. His first, his first period of life is childhood, which he deems roughly from, from birth to about age 11. And then the first adulthood, which he also likens to a sort of extended adolescence and how true that is today. So we can see that with the adult movement and all these people that don't, don't want to grow up and all of us struggle against adulthood to some, to some degree. Um, but this first adulthood or this provisional adulthood, he, he, he shows it being from age 12 to age 40. So then your second adulthood after this sort of midlife period, you know, would be anywhere from 40 plus on essentially. And that's where you're, you're really entering in adulthood. That second adulthood is the real growing up process that occurs. Um, so I found that, I found that quite interesting. 
that is, we think of, you know, physical adulthood as being, okay, now I'm an adult, but it's, it's a pseudo adulthood. Or yeah. A, a yeah. Primordial one or no, a, for sure. Know, preliminary. Well, and, and um, it goes with, you know, that portion of life because primarily we're involved with, you know, our ego, our ego role at that time and trying to develop a career and develop relationships and figure out how we're going to navigate the physical world and so on. And it, so it becomes this, you know, it's a struggle in the outside world. What happens generally at midlife is that we turn to the internal struggle, the internal world, we begin to address meaning, we begin to address, you know, issues of, of vocation versus career vocation, meaning maybe a more passion oriented type of work or, something that the heart actually wants to move towards and things like that. And we have to examine our outer relationships, our inner relationships and so on. But really what's, what's interesting about it, it talks about the first half of life, as I said, as being a provisional personality. Jung talked about the persona, the persona of course, being the sort of mask that we wear that is our roles and our, our particular cultural uh, a particular cultural group that we're from, um, family circumstances, job, education, all that, you know, goes into the construction of this persona. And essentially, that's what the first half of our life is about, is creating that, that mask of who we want other people to see us as, right? Right. Well, I, sometimes I see that little uh, passage, as Hollis says, as being, uh, in some ways, like, puberty mm. um you know in a way at puberty you know you don't have a choice because mm -hmm. um, your body's it's physiological your body's going to do it although in midlife uh, we have the opportunity now life presents us with the need to do that um but it's a little more in us to consciously say okay i am going to go through this second puberty if you will this psychological um uh, growing up yeah no exactly that's a great way to put it you know, and it's interesting, too, because, you know, it, it is in a, in a lot of ways, it is like a puberty. There's a lot of emotional uh, drama and upheaval in one's life. There's it's seemingly, you know, it's less hormonally driven and more psychologically driven. But in some cases, hormonally driven as well. I imagine there are probably changes going on within the body that drive that as well, physiologically. Um, seeing the body starting to break down, seeing gray hairs beginning to feel the aches and pains of age and things like that, it does make us feel mortal, you know, and then we've got to kind of examine like, like where we are in life, where we're going, we may realize, okay, I have, I have less life ahead of me and more life behind me in essence, you know what I mean? For the first time I'm over the, you know, that's what I guess people would say about being over the hill. You're on the sort of down downside of it and not to make it a negative thing, but it, you know, physically speaking, we have less energy and, less strength and stuff that we might've had than we might have when we were younger. Um, God bless that dog, by the way, every, every show, it, every, it just seems every to be on cue. Really yeah. at, at about five or 10 minutes in that dog starts in. And I think that he, he, I think that he, uh, he wants a spot, a guest spot on the show. So he has it each week. And again, thank you, dog. Or maybe they pick up a sponsor dog. for like dog biscuits <laughs> that's or what, something. That's what I'm maybe thinking. Can... It's an opportunity that's what I'm here. Thinking. We're missing. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that is that is a synchronicity happening to show us that we need to reach out to Alpo or something for a sponsorship. So, all right. So anyway, the point is at midlife we generally find ourselves um, creating a completely new sort of uh, relationship to life. You know, and you you know, there's not as many movies and shows about this as there were, say, in the '70s and '80s and even into the '90s. You know, the idea of the classic midlife crisis, a man falls for his secretary, buys a Corvette and, you know, runs off to live in Hawaii or something, leaving the family and wife behind. You know, it's kind of a cliche, but that stuff still does occur. It's still it's still a, a thing. It's a cliche for a reason. I mean, there, you know, in a sense, it's like, um, you know, you're trying to recapture a certain feeling of youth or what have you, but you're kind of going about it in the wrong way. Um, well, that is a necessary function yeah. is the un, unlived, uh, maybe the unclaimed part of youth, uh, because a lot of times what also in a traditional sense, uh, but it still happens to a degree today that we grow up, so to speak, and we go through college or at least finish high school. And then 
you know, military service or academic endeavors and then, you know, marriage and kids, or even if you don't do that, you know, there's career or all the above. Mm -hmm. And, and we kind of move into that. Then if you have kids and you have to, well, I can't do that because I'm a parent now. Um, further you get from that towards midlife, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't get to do this. Or you want one last hurrah or something. It's, we do need to reclaim yeah, yeah, that, for that sure. inner child in a very, very healthy way. And you're right. It does come out in sort of a bizarre way with the secretary and the convertible and, uh, and everything, but it's a, it's, it's kind of a mistaken version yeah. of what actually really psychologically we need to do. And it's that part of our childhood that we reclaim towards our own wholeness and then take with us. It's not about reverting back. It's about going back and picking up maybe something lost and then carrying it with us into the new phase. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. That's a great way to put it. That energy is there. It's just, uh, you know, how one deals with that, that energy to live that unlived life out or live out some of those, those different um, needs, you know, you have to discern between maybe the constructive and the, and the destructive, because often, you know, this is another thing, oftentimes people get caught up in, in a depression or in a situation of substance abuse, or, you know, they'll do something, something very drastic unconsciously uh, to, you know, screw everything up in their life to create these openings that they need unconsciously. And, and really, you know, one of Hollis's main points in the book throughout and, you know, Jungians in general say the same thing is that, you know, you got to work through it consciously. In other words, you need to be aware of what's happening, what's coming up through the unconscious by watching the dreams and seeing what different fantasies are coming up and, and doing, you know, and working through it in a way where, you know, you try to regulate it a bit so you don't go off the deep end and, 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 and create too much damage. I mean, some, some sort of superficial damage is bound to occur anytime there are changes in one's life. Right. But. Well, sometimes we need them. Yeah. We, uh, and that's been known. Sometimes it's been called a Pluto crisis. Um, you know, Pluto being the ruler of the underworld and the underworld being the metaphor for our interior uh, aspect, our shadow, and part of that unlived life, that if we haven't addressed this issue uh, in a meaningful way um, by midlife, we will get a crisis. And that's usually something in the outer world, an illness, a divorce, uh, you know, job uh, loss, yeah. um, something then that, you know, seemingly unrelated, but it's, it almost has to happen. Uh, if we're not doing it purposely, mm -hmm. it'll kind of have something will happen and make, like I said, that opening. And then this can be, a, it's an opportunity. Now it looks like a breakdown. It feels like a breakdown. It feels like the end of your youth yeah. and vitality. Sure. I mean, it, it feels really, well, that's why we you know, go to lengths to either reclaim that or, or get involved in substance abuse um, as a way of you know, not managing it, <laughs> as a way of avoiding. Yeah, that doling that pain or something and not listening to it. Yeah, numbing it mm -hmm. out, but it's, it is a breakdown, but it, it's all these breakdowns are almost always an opportunity for a breakthrough. Definitely. Uh, you know, he, he has a great quote that goes right along with what you're saying. Awakening to the middle passage occurs when one is radically stunned into consciousness. I've seen many begin true middle passage when forced with life threatening illness or widowhood to the point uh, to that point, even into the 50s and 60s, they had managed to remain unconscious. So some part of you, something in the unconscious, what he later on will point out is, is the self with a capital S, that sort of organizing principle, that sort of um, higher part of ourselves um, that, you, that you called the self uh, orchestrates these things, you know, so that if we don't do them ourselves consciously, it will create circumstances whereby we're forced to deal with them unconsciously through an illness, through a breakdown, through a a job loss through a, you know, tragedy of some sort or another. Um, so that's interesting. That's an interesting uh, point you make in there. So essentially what, what I see uh, going on in, in midlife from, from what Hollis talks about is, you know, the first half, as we said, of our lives is spent, you know, creating this persona, creating this sort of provisional personality, you know, and that is essentially based on our family life, our genes, our, 
education, all of the things that come outside of us to shape us. Uh, there, there's some inner factors as well, you know, the gene and DNA factor of it, you know, our physiology, our, you know, the capacities we're born with and, and so on. But essentially, you know, the first half of the life is dealing with the outer world, dealing with material existence, dealing with the body. Um, and mainly our unconscious mind. Okay, so we have our conscious mind, as you know, and, and, and then we have our unconscious mind. Most people are familiar with this term. It was, you know, pretty much um, brought to the idea in the West or brought to the Western mentality through, you know, Freud, Freud and Jung, Jung's work. Um, the idea of this portion of our mind that's below the threshold of consciousness where a lot of things go on that we are quite unaware of, hence the name unconscious. Um, but the bulk of our life, if you looked at, let's say, like an iceberg or something, the tip would be the conscious mind and the, you know, the vast portion of the iceberg that's below the surface of the water would be like into the, the unconscious. And what's really driving that, you know, what you see as that tip of the iceberg is all that, you know, material below the surface of the water, right? So the unconscious not having a sort of rational language speaks to us through dreams. It speaks to us through fantasies and experiences and images and symbols, through ritual and so on. But the main way that it navigates through this material world that we live in, the earth itself and in all of our sort of day-to-day -day experience is through projection, projection. That's a main, one of the main ideas one has to get if one is to understand the midlife crisis. So let me just define projection uh, from, from the book. I'm going to read a little section because this is a key, a key thing we need to understand. So projection is a fundamental mechanism, mechanism of the psyche, a strategy derived from the fact that what is unconscious is projected. The word projection comes from the Latin pro yacere, to throw before to throw before. Jung, Jung has written that the general psychological reason for projection is always an activated unconscious that seeks expression. Projection is never made. It happens. It is simply there in the darkness of anything external to me. I find without recognizing it as such an interior or psychic life that is my own. So, all of these archetypal and complex issues and, and drives and desires and natural instincts that are below the surface that we're not aware of, we project onto others, onto things, onto institutions, and so on. Does that, uh, is that a pretty good overview of projection? Do you have anything to add to that? Well, it is, and you can use the movie projector. Uh, I think movie houses, <laughs> cinemas, still project movies on yeah, we don't even know we don't know i haven't been to the movies in 20 years yeah so there you go. i'm not sure but, <laughs> but it used to be <laughs> you had a film and you would shine a bright light through yeah. it yeah well we have projections for our you know presentations things you can connect them to your iphone sure. but it has to then go up behind a wall or a blank screen to where we can see them you can't see them when they're unconscious you need to have it projected just like from within us if it's an inner need or desire or uh, somehow an unclaimed part of ourselves that's seeking connection and expression, it will find a way to throw itself. And it looks like it's the projection screen in psychologically speaking is often another person. Quite often we see somebody we say, oh my gosh, what, what a jerk. This person just doesn't want to listen to a word I'm saying. And a lot of times, especially if it's something that's really driving you nuts with somebody in your inner circle and around you, uh, it's actually something in you that is saying, pay attention to me, listen to me. Maybe you are not listening, you being yourself. Uh, maybe your own self isn't listening uh, to your inner voice or your higher nature or something like that. So yeah. it's an indicator. And I think there's even a... a a line in the, um, uh, the biblical scriptures about um, not you know, recognizing so much the speck in somebody else's eye until you've taken care of the beam that's in your eye. That, yeah, that what I a... see in you is, is actually maybe a larger problem in me. And I need to take care of my 
issue, um, you've, you've made it noticeable to sure. me. I've seen it. Sure. Uh, but I really need to work on mine. And then once mine's all clear, then maybe I can talk about that little speck once I've removed this large beam that's in mind. Yeah, that's interesting because then, it, you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, of that idea that when we see things we don't like in other people, generally it's something we don't like in ourselves that, that we don't see. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's where that unconsciousness comes into play. You know, it's, we're, we're not consciously aware of these things that are issues until we project the things and people and institutions and, you know, and, and leaders and so on. And then we see those things within ourselves that we don't find so, so great. And we don't want to accept. But that's the trick is then to see it actually being from within yourself. A lot of people just get they get stuck. Get stuck. In, this other person is doing something wrong. Well, yeah, and uh, and that's it, that's the big leap. Exactly. And I'm gonna in a second. I'm gonna go into to von Franz's um, Marie Lu Louise von Franz, of course, another famous Jungian, um, one of the principal uh, analysts that trained under Jung directly. Uh, she had this. Uh, she had a five stage uh, way of looking at projection. The re I'll, I'll go into that in a second, but the important thing about this, why we're spending so much time on this idea of projection is the fact that at midlife, generally speaking, our projections begin to deflate. We begin to pull them back in. So all the energy that was associated and the life and the vitality that was associated uh, with these projections onto people, be that a spouse or parents or, or uh, one's career or so on, uh, suddenly get pulled back within and there's a sort of a deflation or a depression that occurs, you know, and then be we begin to realize that that those things outside ourselves don't have as much meaning or they aren't what we thought they were or that person turns out to be just a normal human being like I am or, you know, whatever comes up to to begin to deflate all these ideas. And that's the, the pulling in of those projections. And then one has to realize all of those things, all those things that I was putting out on other people are things that are within me, the good and the bad, uh, the good and the bad. And midlife is that opportunity where we're able to own those things and go in and, and look within and see how we've been navigating our lives as, as someone else in a sense, you know, dictating our lives have been dictated from the outside in, in a way. And, and at midlife, we get to, we get to begin to learn to live from the, from the inside out. Um, you know, living the inner life, like you like to say. Um, exactly. So the, uh, the five stages of projection that, that, that von Franz pointed out are, are these. So the first one, the person is convinced that the inner, that is unconscious experience is truly outer. That's the first part of projection. The second stage of projection is there's a gradual recognition of the discrepancy between the reality and the projected image. For example, one falls out of love, one loses a job, or suddenly the same energy isn't there anymore for that job or that excitement is gone. Third, uh, one's required to acknowledge this discrepancy. You have to actually be honest about it. Fourth, one is driven to conclude one was somehow in error originally. So you realize that you've been living a lie, essentially. And fifth, one must search for the origin of the projected energy within oneself. And that's what that's what that task of, of midlife really is. And it's scary because, you know, our lives up to this point have been lived in the outer world through accomplishment, through through money, through relationships, through, you know, whatever we think is important. And suddenly all this stuff seems to become unimportant to us, you know, and it's shocking to that part of ourselves. And you, you talked a little bit about this early before the show about that, that death, that philosophical death. Can you, can you ex expound on that a little bit right now? Well, sure. This is something we've talked about in previous podcasts pertaining to ancient mystery schools and various wisdom traditions throughout history, especially ancient ones, uh, secret societies or whatnot. They talk about this philosophic death uh, and, and very much using those terms um, but of course the body and the mind, you know, stay alive. Uh, but what has to die is the beliefs and the connection attachments that we have to this outer, uh, type of, or outer focused living that we've been doing up until this point. And even our best ideas, even, 
even the things we don't question, like the paradigm under which we operate, those are all subject to, yes, death, meaning disconnection and uh, so that a new connection can be made. If we're trying to cross a river, you can't keep one foot on the original side if you want to get across. At some point, you have to really let go. Uh, so there is this leap. Uh, it's a leap of faith. It's a leap of consciousness. Uh, but we have so much in the literature from, again, from traditional sources, ancient sources, and uh, even you know, depth psychology from the 20th century and, and this one um, that tell us that this is okay, and this is a good journey to make and it is okay to let go. Um, but in the, uh, here, I guess I'll just use Hollis's words um, himself. The middle passage occurs in the fearsome clash between the acquired personality and the demands of the self, self with a capital S. A person going through such an experience will often panic and say, I don't know who I am anymore. In effect, the person one has to be is to be replaced by the person to be. The first must die. No wonder there is such enormous anxiety. And once summoned, one is summoned psychologically to die unto the old self so that the new might be born. So again, kind of like puberty that happens physiologically, this has to happen psychologically and the irony is everything that we've learned, um, all that we have worked towards, all that we have believed to be true, this acquired uh, wisdom of the personality up until this point um, may be wrong or it may be not uh, relevant any longer. Yeah. Maybe those things had served us, but now it's time to kind of reevaluate yeah. and say, you know, okay, that got me here but I'm going somewhere else now. And that's a great way I need to, to use those tools and with that wisdom, but we can't do it if we're so tightly gripping the old, the old. way. But this is the way things are supposed to be. It's, if nothing else, try to find a middle ground with some openness. Okay, this is what I believe to be true and I've always held this to be important, uh, but I am willing to look at things in a new way that can get enough space to where you can maybe get a little distance from the old and have enough open space for the, the new way to enter. That's a great way to put it. You know, and, and to remember also that, you know, it seems very dark at the beginning of midlife, you know, having experienced this, both of us, um, and having, uh, and working through it, it's still, it's a working through process, certainly. But, um, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel and there is a new sense of energy and you do gain something greater than, than you lose. But you have to do this consciously. You have to be aware. You have to do some work in the, in the inner world. You've got to, you know, you're going to have to read some books, maybe do a little therapy, do some introspection, do some meditation, journaling, um, and so on. So, you know, and work with, the relationships in your life and bring them back into a proper sort of relation to this new, um, this new way of looking at things. You may do the same things you've always done in your life, but you're going to do them in a different way after midlife or your life may change entirely. Maybe you've been living a, a lie and maybe you've got to change everything about your life in the external world in order to, to live more, more congruently with that, that inner, inner person. But, you know, it, it's not the time to just throw up one's hands and, and give up. It's not the time just to, you know, run off to Tahiti and, and, you know, and leave your spouse and kids behind without a, an explanation and try to take up with a, you know, a 19 year old beach girl or something. But, you know, it's a time to go through stuff, make the changes that need to be made in the external world if that needs to be done, but to do it in a conscious and, um, you know, psychologically constructive way. And, and oftentimes that will require, you know, some, some analysis, some, some therapeutic work, some group work, some reading of books. Hollis is a great place to start. The middle passage that we're discussing today, uh, the middle passage from misery to meaning and midlife is an excellent place to start, an excellent place to start. So he has another book as well, if I might add, the uh, 
finding meaning in the second half of life. Yeah, I have that one. That's a great one as well. Which yeah. I read that one as well. That's a little more, you know, public um, yeah, consumption. Yeah, it is. It is. And this, it? it is. It's a little this, easier. Uh, these, these inner city books um, are are very tightly packed, and there's a lot of academic stuff that's right. in there that may. It, it's not that it it's it takes an expert to read it. I mean, he does explain things. Uh, but I think the uh, yeah, it might be a, finding meaning in the second half of life is, is has a little broader. Good appeal. point. And, and it it, might be. if you don't have a Jungian background and you and you don't, you know, and you, and you need a little uh, a little, uh, you know, kind of a more of an entry point to this material that you're right. That second half of life, uh, finding meaning in second in the second half of life by Hollis, H-O-L-L-I-S, is uh, is is a, is a little less steep of a learning curve, isn't it? That's a good, that's a good point. Thank Correct. you. Thank you. Um, one of the other things that occurs at midlife uh, that's in a lot of mythology, uh, one of the good uh, in mythology and stories and so forth, one of the um, ones that's often cited when, when speaking about midlife and, the, and this particular thing that happens is, uh, is Goethe's uh, Faust tale. And that is the uh, the persona shadow dialogue. Lee is, of course, representing the the shadow uh, within uh, within um, uh, Goethe's Faust character, and um, you know it's an interesting thing. But basically, what the shadow is um, is this portion of ourselves in the unconscious. It's a little pocket, as it were, in the unconscious where we where we hide and shove down and repress different things, memories, instincts, and things about ourselves that we find unacceptable or the culture around us finds acceptable or our family found acceptable, unacceptable, excuse me, unacceptable. Uh, the different parts of ourselves that we don't own, that we don't accept, we push down into what is known as the shadow. The thing is, is that the shadow also contains the alchemical gold, that, that magical elixir that is the magic portion of our life, that, um, that energy and that, that sort of divine part of ourselves can often be pushed down into the shadow as well. Well, well even real gold, even yeah. you know, physical, elemental gold is deep in the mine, in the rock, in the... It is sure. it's buried anyway. Yeah, and it requires a lot of work to get it out. And that's the... Exactly. That's this persona shadow dialogue that occurs in midlife. You know, we're wrestling with these different parts of ourselves that we didn't accept and we're trying to integrate them and we're trying to pull back again, pull back our, our projections. Jung said the best thing that we can do uh, in life is to pull back our shadow projections and realize that these projections are within us. I mean, these projections on a massive scale can cause us, to do horrific things. I mean, you know, we talk about things like, like the Nazi movement or, you know, or Pol Pot or, or, you know, the things that the, you know, the atrocities that occurred under, you know, communist regimes under Stalin and so forth. When we project out onto others, things that we don't accept about ourselves, we're extremely, extremely destructive. And that's, that's the power of the unconscious and the power of the shadow when it's not worked with and it's not recognized. And I think it's very important at midlife to look at what's in there and start to become aware of it. And how do you do this? You look at your dreams, you look at the things that bug you and push your buttons, uh, people that, you know, oh, you know, they do this and they do that. You know, you might place projections onto these types of people or those types of people, cultures, races, genders, whatever. Um, you've got to look at yourself and think what in me is projecting out onto that person. What in me doesn't is recognizing something in them that I am doing or I feel or something that's unconsciously buried within me. And that's a, that's a powerful thing. That's a powerful thing. When they asked Jung if he thought, you know, we would survive as a species into, you know, past the atomic age and so on, he said, if enough people become conscious, and he also spoke about the shadow uh, in that. And so really what he was saying is that, you know, if enough people become consciously aware of the, the, the projections they're putting onto others uh, from their shadow, then yes, we might survive. 
Uh, so, you know, as an individual, that's a gr- one of the greatest things we can do for society is to take back our projections, to take back our shadow projections in particular. Um, and own them so I th- because they are ours. They are We've ours. Given them, like, like the old notion of a scapegoat, that literally they would, a uh, culture or a tribe would put all the, you know, the pains and ills and the sins and everything, the psychic contents they want to get rid of onto an animal, and then it's either sacrificed or, you know, sent off in the woods, um, and, and thereby projecting onto this poor animal, um, your psychological, by killing it or sending it off, you were purging yourself of those things. Exactly. Um, one of the bigger things, too, at this point in life, and this is the last thing we'll get into, and then we'll kind of wrap it up, is the, uh, the anima animus projection. The anima animus projection. So the, the, the anima and the animus are primarily the, what, what is called the contrasexual element within, um, within a person. So for a man, it would be the anima, and that is the sort of feminine that's within man. It's a feminine psychological uh, energy, which is within a man. And the animus is the masculine uh, psychic energy, which is in, in a woman. Generally, during mid or during our, the first half of our life, we will project out those those energies onto our significant other, our wife, our girlfriend, our boyfriend, our husband, what have you, and so that anima or animus energy is projected onto that other person. What happens at midlife then is when people begin that that projection begins to deflate and you begin to pull it back in you begin to see your significant other as a, as just a person. And then all of a sudden you realize, Oh, I don't love this person anymore, for example, or what this, or this person doesn't make me feel good anymore. Or, you know, what this person does annoys me all the time. And you begin to see them as a normal person. And then you fall quote unquote out of love. But really what you're doing is pulling back the projection and realizing that you've been putting something onto that person that's not real. It's a, it's a projection. It's like you've been projecting a film of, of, of a person onto another living being and having them try to live up to the expectations of your inner idea of what they should be, but not who they actually are. And this is why so many marriages end. This plus the fact that kids now are grown and have gone off to live their own lives and you no longer have that buffer between you uh, and and many other factors. But it's something to to look at very strongly if you yourself are in this phase of life and you're beginning to sour in your relationship. Make sure you're starting to look at things, you know, within yourself to make sure that, you know, the 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 feelings that you're feeling towards this other person are are genuine and they're not something that you're generating within or something that's, you know, being, you know, that, 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 that projection is being pulled back and so on. So those are, those are changes that, that occur, you know, and that the reality is, is that at this point, there's an opportunity for a deeper relationship with that person because you can actually recognize them as a human being now. And they're not something that's living within, you know, it's not a projection of your, your fantasy world from within, but you're actually able to see them as a real, a real person and an individual. And that, that can represent a a new level of relationship. It also can represent the fact that you made a mistake. That's not unheard of. I mean, people do make mistakes when they fall in love and they may find that they want to end that relationship. But Hollis and all the unions would, 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 and I would say too, um, and I'm sure you would agree, you know, examine that relationship and be conscious and try to do the work on that relationship before you just give up because you may be experiencing this deflation of projection and not, you know, a real change in feeling towards this person. It's just, it is a change in feeling, but it's not necessarily the fact that you don't love this person. There's just a shift in the way that you look at them that may lead to a greater love and may lead to a deeper love. But unless you do it consciously, you know, you, 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 you can't, you can't make that shift. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Does that, does that uh, resonate I do. with you as well? Uh, certainly when we 
and the relationship to, or especially when we're a little bit older, if it's in your teens or twenties or something, you may just go from one to the next because sure, you're learning, learning process, life and learning right? about people. Yeah. But say if you're then a little bit older and you've been in a relationship for a while, maybe you've had children, maybe it's a marriage type thing. Um, after you've been through enough of those, at some point, if you end it too early, the chances are you're just going to project that on the next person. It doesn't matter who it is. You could pick someone completely different on the surface, but you're going to pick those unresolved parts of yourself. Uh, and I like what you're saying about maybe staying in a little bit longer because two things can happen. Like you're saying, once we pull back the projection and own it, um, we're taking responsibility for ourselves, not blaming somebody else for not doing our thing. And secondly, you're right, we get to see this person for who they really are once we've stripped this projection. So if the relationship, if you then see somebody for who they really are and you're being responsible for yourself, and it seems like there's not much left in the relationship, well then, how, what a better time and place to end it when there's all this honesty and, and true realization. Um, or something can come up and you can really have this, uh, like you said, a deeper relationship. And, um, and one thing I kind of want to add to what we've been talking about, you know, this ending this old way and, and allowing this new to begin, um, we're actually becoming whole. It's not, okay, this half was bad and I'm going to erase that and now I'm going to completely replace it. It's the new one takes precedent. <laughs> the new one is in the driver's seat because the old one carried us so far. Now we have a new vehicle, but it's this total experience uh, that makes us whole. So this, like you quoted before about instead of going towards perfection we're going towards wholeness mm, yeah and i think that's good to keep in mind that we're becoming whole as our when we pull back the projection uh we are more integrated because they're not being thrown out there they're being so we become more whole and we see the other person as being whole people too yeah exactly and it's so, you know they always say there's a there's a saying and in, 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 in Jungian stuff and i may have said this before but i will repeat it if i did um you know, in, 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 the, in the Jungian psychological work, you're not striving per, per, for perfection. You're not striving for perfection. You're striving for wholeness. So that may mean there are different disparate parts of ourself, but they're integrated within us and we're in dialogue with them and we recognize them and we own them. You know, and there's a holistic sort of a, a structuring that takes place. It doesn't mean that it, you know, silences all these different parts of yourself and crushes them. It means that it puts them into dialogue with with the self, the self, the higher self, um, and it puts us into alignment with our with our true purpose and our true meaning. Um, so, at any rate, I do want to encourage anyone who's going through the difficulties of middle life uh, to have patience and fortitude, and you know, definitely uh, pray and meditate and contemplate. Uh, what's happening to yourselves, but also have some hope that things will get better. There is a light at the end of the tunnel and so on. And uh, as we spoke today about, uh, um, about James Hollis's book, the middle passage from uh, misery to meaning in midlife uh, as being a good uh, resource to start with. You can also, uh, as Chris pointed out, maybe start with uh, finding meaning in the second half of life by James Hollis. That's another great book. It's a little more accessible. This one's a little more to the point and pack, packed with a lot of, of unions stuff and, and specific uh, uh, terminology, whereas the, uh, this, the finding meaning in the second half of life is a little more general. It's for a, a wider audience, you'd say. I, both are great places to start. And he has excellent bibliographies for other places to go as well uh, in terms of uh, finding more information about midlife. But do... Uh, do you have faith that things are getting better and you will find meaning in that, uh, in that suffering and struggling because there is meaning in there and the, uh, the answer lies within uh, to find that. I'm going to read one, uh, one last passage and then I'm going to read a quick poem at the end that I really enjoyed. Uh, so at the, he's, uh, Hollis says, individuation, Jung's myth for our time. Individuation is really this process of becoming a oneself, one's true self. And he says, at the moment of decision, the high adventure of the soul is never more clear. In grabbing the wheel, we take responsibility for the journey, however frightening it might be, 
however lonely or unfair it may seem. In not grabbing the wheel, we stay stuck in the first childhood, excuse me, stuck in the first adulthood, stuck in the neurotic aversions which constitute our operant personality and therefore our self-estrangement. At no point do we live more honestly or with more integrity than when surrounded by others, yet knowing oneself to be alone, the journey of the soul beckons and we say yes to it all. Yes to it all. So we become an integrated and whole person. All right. And this last little, little bit is from uh, the German poet Rilke. And it is on page 117. 117. I live, in, I live my life in growing orbits, which move out over the things of the world. Perhaps I can, never, I can never achieve the last, but that will be my attempt. I'm circling around God, around the ancient tower, and I've been circling for a thousand years, and I still don't know if I am a falcon or a storm or a great song. Or a great song. Beautiful words from... The poet, from the poet Rilke. All right. Well, I hope that is a bit helpful. It's a start. Midlife is a process. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of great books out there. These are uh, the ones we spoke about are a couple you can start with. Uh, Thank you for your insights and your your ideas, Chris. I appreciate you here every week. You're a a great blessing to the show. Um, Thank you for listening. You've been here in the Cosmic Eye. I'm your host, Jason Napolitano. Uh, author of If You Can Worry, You Can Meditate. And my co-host is Chris Sheridan, author of The Spirit in the Sky, both of our books available on Amazon.com, or my book is at CosmicEye.org. Chris's is at ChrisSheridan.com as well. Thank you. Have a great week. God bless.